how can I avoid being deceived? How can I uncover nature's secrets? These questions are central to the epistemological projects of Rene Descartes and Francis Bacon, respectively, and they've set the agenda for epistemology and philosophy of science to this day. Both Bacon and Descartes offer theories of knowledge for skeptical inquirers looking to build their own view of the world after rejecting previous scientific and philosophical explanations. Now, philosophers and scientists are still engaged in inquiry, but it's not the only intellectual inter enterprise. In fact, the vast majority of information we possess has not been discovered by us. It comes from others. In our current culture, the avalanche of available information raises epistemological problems. On many topics, from the efficacy of vaccination to the effects of climate change, the challenge is not just figuring out the truth, but sharing that truth so that everyone comes to see it and accept it. Given the importance of social networks and distributed knowledge, something that people like John Greco have really emphasized, I think epistemology should not only discuss the methods appropriate to inquiry and discovery, it should also consider the virtue appropriate to receiving knowledge, to taking it on. And so my project, what I'm going to do in this talk, is to make the case for the intellectual virtue of receptivity in addition to the virtues of inquiry that have provided the framework for modern discussion. Now, the intellectual virtue of receptivity, as I conceive of it, uh, this is two on your handout, <clears throat> is a habit of being open to receiving knowledge from the right sources, in the right way, at the right times, and for the right reasons. That's my quasi-Aristotelian <laughs> definition. <clears throat> so, in some cases, the views and, tes of, and testimony of others can serve as materials for one's investigation, stuff that I work on. But in the receptive case, what I do is, is, is fully take it on <clears throat> as something given. So I'm going to start by laying out the virtue of receptivity in opposition to the relevant vices. <clears throat> now, there are two obvious vices that prevent us from proper, properly uh, taking on the views of others. The vice that many epistemologists are worried about is gullibility, 3A on your hand up, when I'm too open to others informing my beliefs. And this it can go along various dimensions. I might treat too many um, people in communities as authorities or grant too much weight to sources. I base my whole raw meat diet on one, one, one study that I, that I found on the internet. Or I might take on true beliefs for the wrong reasons. Maybe it's true that drinking red wine is good for your health, but if I believe that because I want to believe that and would refuse to modify it in the face of counter evidence, then I'm believing it for the wrong reasons. And there's also reason to think that this, these sort of vices are going to be relatively domain specific. So I could be gullible or obstinate about, um, about nutrition, but not about the physics of motion, or vice versa. Maybe I have my own physical theory I'm very attached to. Um, so we have gullibility on the one extreme, and on the other extreme is obstinacy, not being open enough, 3B on your hand. So this involves a refusal to see the value of what others think. Now, almost all epistemologists hold that there's some sort of vice in this vicinity, since they think there's some value in what others say, a value we can wrongly ignore. So in cases of pure disagreement, for instance, even those who hold that remaining steadfast in the face of disagreement can be reasonable, think that's true only under certain conditions. There are conditions under which ignoring the, the, the force of what others think would, would really be wrong. So those are the two extreme vices. What does it take to be in the mean, to rightly value the opinions of others? I think many epistemologists, at least implicitly, take uh, what I call an executive view of receiving knowledge, number four on your handout. On this view, I should always act like an excellent judge does, weighing and evaluating the views of others to incorporate them into a considered view for which I'm personally responsible. I think this fits well with how we like to conceive of ourselves as epistemic agents, and it also fits well with Western culture's emphasis on the self-sufficiency of the individual. But I think this picture often involves self-deception about the dependence we in fact have on others. In my view, there's a third insidious kind of vice. It's less obvious, but at least as dangerous. I call it false pride. And as I think of it, I'm exhibiting this vice when I accept beliefs from others who are more expert or better positioned, 
but think of the knowledge I get as something I discovered and established myself, not as something I received from another. Now, if there is such a bias, I think it becomes more plausible to think there should be an intellectual virtue of receptivity, not just executive intellectual virtues like weighing testimony skillfully or being good at evaluating evidence. I'm going to mention three related phenomena that, to my mind, suggest the existence of something like false pride. So first of all, there's the psychological phenomena of the illusion of understanding, something many of the participants in the science of intellectual humility have done important work on. We tend to rate our knowledge quite highly, but when asked to actually explain how a toilet works, how the theory of evolution works, how a cap-and-trade policy would help with global emissions, we tend to fail miserably. <laughs> and this forces us to concede that, at, at the least, we didn't have knowledge in the way we thought we did. Our initial high confidence suggests that we thought we fully possessed this knowledge for ourselves when in fact we're unable to individually explain and support our beliefs. And of course there's the more general phenomenon of overconfidence that's found not just among the general population but also among experts in areas such as medicine, engineering, and psychology. And I think there's some evidence that false pride is becoming easier and more seductive in the age of mobile information when we can summon support for our position with a few keystrokes by asking Siri. Um, and I, I like this study that the uh, Yale Cognition and Development Lab did as part of their project where they found that being a, just being able to search the internet for something makes us more convinced that we really know about the subject we search for and also about unrelated subjects. <laughs> Furthermore, even when the test subjects were constrained to only looking at one website and the controls group got the same text that was on that website, the people who accessed the internet for themselves still rated their knowledge more highly than the control group that, that didn't get the feeling of inter accessing the internet but got all the same information. So this suggests that we do treat, treat the internet as a sort of extended mind and take ourselves to personally know whatever we think we can find out by using it. Possibly everything. <laughs> and I think this isn't just about knowledge, but also with reasoning and judging. When we encounter evidence or opinions we disagree with, we often look for grounds to dismiss it by finding a debunking source to trust, a common internet debating tactic. But if I don't personally possess mastery of the issue and evidence in question, I just do a quick search and find someone who agrees with me and cite them, then I don't th count as having figured the issue out for myself, even if I'm the one deciding which sources to trust. And this ties into the, the third phenomenon, 6C on your handout, um, that our own evaluations of how and why we learn from others often involve attribution errors. So psychologists have generally found that we often attribute the positive results of our actions to our own skill and achievement while blaming outside factors when things go badly. So, in the, I think in the cognitive realm, I, I can think my skill at assessing reliable evidence, that's what explains why I believe true scientific theories, where it's the mistakes of scientists that explain why I believe false ones. I'm not at fault, it's, it's those people's fault. Um, and I think this is dangerous, um, because as Ed, Edwin, Edwin Hutchins puts it in his, his book, Co Cognition in the Wild, Thinking that individual minds operate in isolation, quote, encourages us to mistake the property of complex socio-cultural systems for the properties of individual minds. So when we're in a cognitive ecology that works well, we can easily attribute the system's virtues to ourselves, giving us false pride. And it can also lead to low intellectual or moral estimations of those with whom we disagree, since we attribute their errors to intellectual vices and stupidity without considering the relevant socio-cultural context. And it's also worth noting that e even those engaged in investigation often crucially depend on deferring to experts in other areas. So Frank Tao has this nice example of an e how an expert in cell movement, if you look at all the fields they depend on, it's going to include mechanical forces, lattice structures, fluorescent chemistry, computational biology, optics. They're all this field that their research depends on. And no one is an expert in each and every field there. So that's a good example of Hutchins' point 
about systems. And if expert inquirers still exhibit such dependencies in the research they're carrying out, then there's even more reason, I think, that those of us who are receiving the knowledge transmitted um, are not exercising executive personal judgment um, in all these cases. So that's some of the psychological evidence for thinking there can be something like false pride at work um, when we evaluate and think about our beliefs. So what would the virtue of receptivity look like? On my view, the virtue of receptivity is a meta-virtue or a regulative virtue. Given the huge variabilities in reliability and informativeness across different domains, I don't think it can be a virtue governed by rigid rules that apply almost universally. Instead, it must be developed in a particular social environment and cannot be automatically transferred to significantly different environments. It involves calibrating your attitudes towards those people and communities with whom you interact and adapting to different sources of information and being aware of dependencies. And my general account of the conditions under which it's appropriate to be exercised is that I should be receptive when I'm receiving information from an appropriate source and when my further individual examination of evidence or reasoning about the matter in the time I have available is unlikely to be of significant epistemic value. So how do I determine when such conditions are, are met, well, when I should enter receptive mode? Well, I think many of the first steps are social. I calibrate my levels of trust based on my social environments and the available signposts. I trust those with established credentials who are also trusted by those within my community. This allows me to use the knowledge of other community members and helps get applicable heuristics. I can tell whether or not someone has the credentials and whether or not those credentials are widely accepted, even if I know little about the subject matter itself. And I think this clearly works quite well for areas that have relatively well-defined boundaries and expertise. So while doctors and car mechanics sometimes make a mistake, I'm better off deferring to them than trying to, trying to figure out my health problems or my car problems on my own, assuming I don't possess those expertises. Now, many epistemologists worry that relying on social behavior and conventions will prevent me from properly tracking the relevant epistemic features of information sources. So, here's a counterexample. Mutual fund managers have impressive credentials and are trusted by many. A lot of people give them their money to, to manage. Um, but they're unable to consistently demonstrate any security selection abilities and often harm their clients by frequently engaging in transactions. The research, research on performance has, has found. So isn't this sort of example suggests that I need to consider the evidence for myself and not, not just trust the experts? I think the question is whether this example illustrates a ubiquitous problem with trusting experts or whether there are specific features of financial management structures, such as conflicts of interest, the difficulty in beating the market, that explain that case. Note that many domains of knowledge and action, unlike the financial case, are not zero-sum or even competitive. It's also an easy case for dismissing the experts, as the goals of financial management are well-defined, getting making more money than you would otherwise, and the research is convincing on the limitations. Whereas things are far less clear in domains that are, that are harder to uh, assess outcomes. So I think the question is, how much monitoring should we do of our, of our sources? And, and this issue has been central to the epistemology of, of testimony. Some, such as Tyler Burge, hold default justification views on which you're entitled to believe what you're told as long as no serious warning signs are present. So what I'll call a weak monitoring view. So you're aware of red flags, but you're not carefully assessing each and every um, thing that you're told. Whereas a lot of reductionists about testimony think you do need to always carefully weigh the testimony because they don't think testimony as such, being told by others, has, has independent epistemic value. Testimony's force comes from other epistemic factors, such as its reliability <coughs> or the way in which it can be a basis for inference to the truth of what's, what's said. 
And so this, this leads a lot of reductionists to advocate a, a strong monitoring view. So Elizabeth Fricker, for example, in um, some early work described the rigorous monitoring the reductionist insists on as follows, quote, the hearer must always be monitoring the speaker critically. This is a matter of the actual engagement of a counterfactual sensitivity. It is true throughout of the hearer that if there were any signs of untrustworthiness, she would pick them up. Now, in my view, I think the virtue of receptivity involves something much more like weak monitoring than, than strong monitoring. It does involve some basic source monitoring of the sort I discussed above. Do others trust this source? Is the subject matter in question something one could have knowledge about? For example, if I'm looking for nutritional guidance, I might determine what kinds of sources to trust. Reliable media sources, journals of nutrition, social science, official government guidelines, and so on. And after source monitoring, uh, there's also a place for monitoring the specifics of the claim in question. So, if I read a news article suggesting that high carbohydrate diets are less likely to lead to effective weight loss than low ones, I could, after checking the, the source, I could still examine whether, I should, I should still examine whether the actual assertions made by researchers match the headlines, maybe the findings were more limited or ambiguous than initially presented, and I can consider whether the evidence presented by the researchers, assuming they're accurately and fairly reporting it, would support their, their conclusion. Was the study a randomized controlled trial? Did it suffer from sample size or measurement issues? I think this sort of thing is relatively low-hanging fruit and doesn't require expertise in the subject area, just a general familiarity with reasoning and broad background information about the world that is the sort of knowledge that the virtue of receptivity will, will require. But say it passes the source monitoring and, and evidence supporting tests, should I now believe it or do I need to go further and examine the article itself in detail and read up on the literature? This is the point at which I think if I'm inquiring for myself into this field, I need to, I need to keep going. I, I, I need to do all those steps. But not if I'm acting as a receiver. When I don't have the full training or skills in the relevant areas, getting more information about the study details or first order evidence may not be helpful. Now, the advocate of strong monitoring might object that I haven't done enough work to establish that this particular study is reliable and trustworthy. I need to figure out for myself, not just look at the, the news, news, news article. I need to, to look at the literature and see, is this, this the dominant view or a minority? Are there further studies supporting it? Otherwise, I'm not really being critical and properly examined the credentials of the testimony. But I think these requirements are asking too much of someone who's not a researcher and is not trying to master that field, i.e. most people. If before accepting it we needed to do a critical reading of every scientific article reported to us, followed by a literature survey, the range of our knowledge would be desperately narrow. In addition to the issues of time and interest constraints, there are issues of practice and expertise. Even if I'm skilled in my own areas of interest, this doesn't mean I will be good at examining and scrutinizing other disciplines. Different areas have their own standards and their own methods. You can't be an adequate critic unless you know what you're critiquing. And many people haven't developed researching skills of this sort at all. So I think going into more detail takes a lot of effort for little payoff or negative payoff if my lack of expertise leads me astray. Now, perhaps the advocate of strong monitoring will say this, this, this isn't really their position. Maybe I need to check the abstract and survey details of a journal or, or a researcher or a field carefully a few times, but then I build up a track record and come to know that going forward I'll be justified in accepting what's, what's, what's said by this, this researcher or this field in, a, in the future. I, I put in the work at first and then it pays off later. But I'm, I'm not convinced by the, this sort of reply. News media, scientific journals, um, even, even individual researchers are not always consistent, either across time or subject matter in their reliability and accuracy. And knowing that a specific journal or researcher is, is reliable isn't going to help me 
when considering broadly how much weight to put on psychological or ec economic findings. So in my view, the advocate of strong monitoring is either asking too much or giving out the wrong sort of credit. So if we always have to inquire for ourselves and decisively establish the truth of what we're told, <clears throat> the strong monitor is, is asking too much. If, on the other hand, the monitoring being asked for amounts to nothing more than what I'm, I've described, some source monitoring and basic but limited content monitoring, then I agree with these requirements, but not the characterization of the monitor's role. We're not entitled to think that I've decisively established the truth of the information I received. And I think this, this version of the strong monitoring view gives me the wrong sort of credit. It acts as if I weighed and judged the subject matter or did it, uh, some real critical work when, when I didn't. There was some monitoring of sources and content, but this was largely done socially and communi communally, not individually. So I can get credit for being appropriately receptive, but I think that's an importantly different credit than what inquirers get for discovering knowledge. I think we really re need to recognize that receptivity is an inherently social virtue. Um, as David Dunning and others have pointed out, we often have trouble recognizing expertise unless we're experts ourselves. And this is a problem for the executive view on which I'm personally and individually responsible for assessing the weight of everyone's testimony. There I have to do all the heavy intellectual lifting myself. But the way I'm characterizing receptivity, it's an embedded intellectual practice that involves sounding out trusted community members, friends, and other, other connections. And that helps to make up for the gaps in knowledge and judgment that we face. Now, I want to note at this point that my view doesn't hold that we should always treat sources, even highly reliable sources, passing on high quality information in this receptive way. Um, those who serve as fellow inquirers or as distributors of knowledge are responsible for evaluating and weighing what the source says. And sometimes this responsibility is built into the distribution process, as in peer review. Um, but even when this is not an explicit part of the role, distributors need to take responsibility for examining the results of inquiry. So I think the student can just believe the textbook, but the, 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 the teacher, because of her position as a distributor of knowledge, needs to be more cautious and skeptical. And the patient can believe the doctor, but the doctor, even if the doctor isn't doing drug research, the doctor still needs to be skeptical and careful about examining the claims of the um, drug, drug pharmaceutical representatives that are, that, are, that, are, that, are, that are telling her about the drug. So I think where someone has a key role as distributors in our information ecology, they do need, they do need to use the, the, the more, more demanding examination that in, inquirers do instead of exercising the kind of receptive attitude that I'm talking about. I also think even when you're primarily a recipient of information, your practical interests can raise the stakes and require more involvement. It's a little like pragmatic encroachment. So for example, when the topic is a disease you suffer from, the importance of the issue to you may require you to enter into inquiry mode and look into all the available evidence and studies presented. Um, and I also think practical factors can undercut your entitlement to accept expert testimony. <clears throat> For example, when you perceive a different difference in goals and values between the expert and yourself, it's appropriate to treat their testimony differently. So if the doctor's goal is maximizing survival and minimizing risk of litigation, and the terminally ill patient's goals are avoiding unnecessary interventions and maximizing the quality of his last days of life, that difference in goals might reasonably put the patient out of receptive mode even though the patient doesn't have doubts about the doctor's knowledge base. So there are both intellectual and practical considerations um, come into whether, whether you should be in receptive mode or not. So I've laid out some characteristics of what I'm calling the intellectual virtue of re receptivity and discuss the conditions under which it should be exercised. I want to conclude by briefly outlining 
the value of this intellectual virtue. To begin with, recognizing dependence is inherently worthwhile. I can be more grateful to others who share their knowledge when I recognize that I'm not a solitary epistemic agent capable of sorting the truth from the false on my own. Receptivity also encourages charity towards those with different views, insofar as I acknowledge that differences in belief stem not just from individual intellectual virtues and vices, but from embedded ecologies of knowledge and wider issues about which communities to trust. Along similar lines, receptivity encourages openness towards belief modification because most, mo it does not treat all my beliefs as hard-won possessions I have to fight for. Most of my beliefs, I, I haven't, I haven't done, done the hard work and I don't need to be so attached to them. Finally, the virtue of receptivity encourages developing and maintaining good ecosystems of knowledge instead of thinking that we can always filter out the bad and keep the good on our own. Virtues, especially ones that involve a combination of motivational and intellectual excellences, are hard to achieve. While I often can't achieve knowledge on my own, working together with social communities of knowers can help me believe the right things for the right reasons. Thank you. I'll be running the queue and we're going to have to end promptly at 10.10, so I apologize ahead of time for cutting things off when I do. Just a just a quick question. Uh, I'm wondering what uh, you think uh, intellectual humility is, and what you're talking about is related to it. So I I would think of what I'm talking about as being an aspect of intellectual humility, in that receptivity is the way to be intellectually humble in receiving knowledge under these conditions. So it doesn't. Um, Whereas I think other parts of intellectual humility would have to do with um, how I evaluate myself and what I'm knowing. And, and I think there will also be a different sort of intellectual humility for the inquirer. Um, so yeah, so, so I'd say it's one, one aspect, or it would fall under the heading of intellectual humility, but to be just a part. Uh, yes, yeah. Okay, thanks for those. My question is just uh, whether it, it seems to me as you're talking that, that you're sort of talking about maybe two virtues because there's the, the moral aspect and the epistemic aspect and the way that you initially characterized peace activity was just being open to receive knowledge mm. and it had nothing to do with these attribution errors mm. with attribution mm -hmm. which is what you talked about later recognizing where your, where your knowledge came from so it seemed like I was just wondering if um, recognizing the tendency could be a separate virtue and receiving knowledge appropriately could be a... So recognizing the tendency would be a separate moral virtue and receiving uh, mm -hmm. knowledge appropriately Perfectly. would be a separate epistemic virtue. Or what do you want to... What, what do you say to that? Yeah. So I, I, I see how in terms of de definition, it might seem like you could give a definition of each that wouldn't, um, that wouldn't involve the other as elements. Um, I guess why I've been putting them together is it is partly, as a matter of fact, it seems that recognizing that dependency could, could help you, you be open to receiving knowledge in, in the right way. So I guess I'm thinking of it th that to put this virtue into practice, you need to have some intellectual good habits about receiving knowledge, but then, then also these habits of acknowledging dependency, and those, those will, will, will work together. And I think that's why I did describe it as maybe a virtue that uh, has, as parts, both motivational and intellectual elements. So, so I, I think I want to say that for, for this to really function as a virtue in the way it's supposed to, you, you need need both those parts, but, but, I, but I acknowledge that they're distinct. I, yeah, I, I, I'll think more about whether, how, how far they can be separated out. John? Thanks, Caleb. Uh, so, um, I'm, I'm sympathetic, I'm very sympathetic with the broad picture, which I take to include getting away from the executive view mm -hmm. and replacing it with a uh, kind of virtue of so I have a few questions about when you're in this receptivity 
mode. So it seems as though um, when you're in this receptivity mode, you are going to be able, that's going to be a source of knowledge for you when things go well. Mm -hmm. But it also seems as though it's going to be um, uh, largely opaque to you when things are going well and when things aren't going well. Because you're in this, mm -hmm. you, know, you can think of yourself as in these channels of information coming at you, and there's, lot, there's good stuff, but there's also junk. And in a receptivity mode, you're to some extent able to filter out the junk, but not as if you were in a much more mm -hmm. strict mode, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, two questions. One, do you think that um, that position uh, uh, sort of undermines a kind of reliability requirement or a kind of discrimination requirement uh, on knowledge in the receptivity mode? And, and if the answer to that question is yes, is that generalized? Can knowledge in other, from other ways and modes and sources uh, also um, be or, or do you have that required, that sort of reliability or mm -hmm. tracking requirement uh, in place in general, but not for this sort of reception of knowledge from experts? Uh, yeah, so I go back and forth. I think the way to defend the reliability of here would be, be to build, build, build more into um, what you have to do to engage with the social community. You, 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 you sort of see whether the communities and practices you're involved with seem to be doing good. And if that's the case, m m maybe there's some kind of reliable judgment about that that then puts you in a position to say, I can enter into this channel of information and be Reason, although it'll be fairly opaque to me, I can be reasonably confident that that that, that it's reliable. Um, but I'm uh, yeah, I'm a little torn on whether that's that's still asking too much or asking for something we, we, we wouldn't be able to do. Sort of evaluate the ecology of knowledge from outside before before entering into it. So um, I'm. Yeah, I'm not sure how much I want to say. Either insist, so there's, I could, I could say, you get. I think I want to say you get information you can act on um, through these channels, even if some of it's junk. And if, and if, if that's most of what it takes to be, to be, to be knowledge, then, then you could think of it as knowledge. But depending on how demanding a conception of knowledge um, we're, we're, we're working with. In, 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 in some contexts, I'd be happy to admit that acting in this receptive mode gives you information you can act on, but maybe won't meet the, the, the standards that some people have of, of, of knowledge. But, but if it's just a question about word, then I don't, I, I, I don't have a real investment in that. I'm sympathetic to rejecting the executive view, but I wonder what it does when you have to make choices because of expert decision, mm -hmm. especially when the disagreement is among experts who are not members of the same epistemic community. So, suppose I, suppose I want to know how to live a very long time. Um, I get one piece of advice from my family doctor, I get another piece of advice from some people publishing in a clinical journal, and I get a third piece of advice from my 105 year old great aunt. And all of these different pieces of advice are not mutually consistent with each other. Mm -hmm. And each of these people are experts in a sense, but they don't really interact with each other very often. Um, they're, not, they're not quite, they're possibly not members of the same epistemic. So how do I decide which one to trust in a way that doesn't end up just stepping back to the executive view where I, I now have to choose between different Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I think I, I, I gave a nutrition example partly because I didn't want to, you can give the really easy examples where there's, you know, uh, about uh, vaccination or something where, where there, there's a clear answer and there's one group that's experts and all. But then there, there, there are these cases where it's not clear if this research is enough to be convincing and or is is it might not be better than the nutritional advice your 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 great aunt gives you, whatever. Um, and in those kind of cases, I think, and I, I think that that example is good because in. The, it, you don't you don't sort of fully have the option of suspending judgment. That's that's easy to do. If there's a disagreement about what killed the dinosaurs, I can you know, I, 
my son's invested in that question. I'm not that invested in that question. Um, but if it's about you know something like diet and lifestyle, I have to eat a certain way and live a certain way. So 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 I, so I feel the force of that. Um, and there, I mean, I think it is going to go back to who you decide to trust. Um, and maybe going back to Matt's question, I do tend to think of that as something that's going to involve both epistemic and and um, social and pragmatic factors as well. So, I, so I, I would say my view of that isn't just going to be the executive view because um, I want to take, I think the, per, the, per, the person's appropriate choice is going to take into account um, social and pragmatic factors about who they're attached to, who they trust, and why in, in, in ways that, 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 that aren't just captured by the narrowly epistemic. So, it's not the executive view, but but, but I think it, it, those are those are just tough cases, and I don't have like a a, a great clear thing to say about here here, here here is a decision procedure for, and I, I guess that's partly what I want to say is just that's the tough thing about being receptive is because you don't have a complete knowledge base, then you, then uh, there'll be more cases where you have to have to act out of a, a limited limited. So this is, was actually a follow-up to Dan, and this is just a small friendly suggestion. So um, you mentioned you wanted to kind of assimilate receptivity to humility. And uh, one way you might do that, uh, so given the account that Dan and others have developed uh, of humility as owning one's limitation, you might just think um, being receptive is one way in which one owns one's mm -hmm. limitations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I know, I like that, and that'd be part of what I'd, I'd want to build into that. Um, and then also, actually, based on what, what Kent's talk last night, I think another aspect I want it would also be a sort of motivational part, that you own your limitations, but you're also uh, are all right with your limit. You're, you, 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 you're grateful that others are doing this work, and you're not, I'm not mad that I'm not figuring out everything for myself. I, I, I know those limitations, and then I'm, I'm grateful to those who are helping me go beyond what I could know on my own. But yeah, thanks. I'm sorry, I, your name, I called you Neil, I apologize. <laughs> uh, let's see, I can't do next. Uh, so I think we're going to have to wrap up now. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Well, I mean that it's, or regular, that it's not just, um, going to say do X or take in knowledge X right now in in this way it'll 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 both have when, when I sort of calibrate it it'll have judgments about particular cases but I'll but I also sort of need to recalibrate it in different environments so I need to figure out you know what does it mean to be to be uh, receptive to my child's pediatrician is different than a what it, what it means to be receptive to to to, front, to a colleague uh, in a different department whose expertise or or my my grandma who's sharing her you know hard earned life wisdom so the 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 thought is it's it's not just about uh, it it involves regulating in these different sorts of environments and situations what it means to 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 to, to receive as opposed to having one uniform account of receptivity that I just apply in each and every case is it tells me do I do receptivity A or B or C or yeah, that's it. yeah uh, the notion of receptivity as uh, an inherently social process phenomenon um, I guess my, my question is to what extent do you think that intellectual humility in the expert uh, facilitates or impairs uh, receptivity and, um, and you might have addressed it but I just didn't pick up on it but what I'm thinking of is like the, the doctor or, or the teacher we, we see it sometimes in the classroom too where uh, you know how, how fair handed should you be uh, in, in this, of course, you've got the ethics of honesty and so forth. But, but, uh, but when the person comes back and says, "Yeah, but what do you think?" That's what I want uh, to get an to get an answer. What 
and, and then you get the sense that they're going away with just your, mm. your assessment. Yeah. I think that's tough because often what you're doing in the classroom, your, your students should be engaging in inquiry. You, you don't want to. It's, it's not that they come for a, a consult in the right. philosophy office about, here's your problem, I'll solve it, and I'll just tell you what to believe. Um, but, but, I, but I do think that, that experts um, play a large role in how receptive you can be. Because I, th I think one serious problem for exercising receptivity is that experts are often ha have this overconfidence in a particular uh, uh, being uh, unaware of the, the boundaries of their, their, their knowledge. And so if I just, as a teacher, seem like I'm sure on every single philosophical question you know, you, you could ask, then, um, well, either he'll, you'll end up taking on board all these questionably supported philosophical positions, or you just won't be receptive in those cases where I actually do know what I'm talking about. So, so I think there's a real need for teachers and doctors and scientists and so on to be, to be very careful about only asking people to enter the receptive mode when, 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 when it really is um, warranted. I'm over in psychology, so my question might seem a little weird here, but um, uh, over in psychology. I try to be receptive. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so in psychology, we often make a distinction between normative models of psychological functioning versus more descriptive mm -hmm. models of psychological functioning. And, um, this kind of sounds like a, a talk about sort of what people ought, ought to do. Mm -hmm. It sounds like a kind of normative mm -hmm. notion. And, um, one of the big constraints, of course, in this, you know, when you're trying to develop a descriptive model of how people actually do function is, is oftentimes they're distracted and they're operating under conditions where cognitive capacity is limited. Mm -hmm. um, they're dual tasking. Uh, you've got the, you know, the chickens in the oven. The, this, someone else is talking over here. Your baby screaming. All these things are happening at the same time. Um, and uh, I'm wondering if you thought about how being under these conditions of distraction that we all face in our day-to-day -day lives uh, might play into your framework. In other words, does it make it, is it unrealistic? Mm -hmm. Is this realistic or only under certain types of conditions? Right. You know, I think that's a real worry because I think partly what I'm doing is saying some of normative epistemological theories that philosophers put forward are just asking too much of us. Um, so I don't want it to be the case that my well, 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 the theory I'm now putting forward of receptivity is also way, 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 way too, too demanding under normal conditions. Now, no, I'm not. I think it is a difficult virtue to achieve. So, so, so I'm not. I'm not looking for an account on which you know most of us will turn out to be receptive most of the time. But um, there, I would, in terms of these cognitive load conditions, again, I would think that. To me, that's something that where improving the ecology of knowledge is very important. So that's something people are trying to do work on. H how do you actually effectively get out? You know, food guidelines or these other me 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 methods where um, me 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 messages where for a long time, you know, people just you, know, you sort of put the information out there and you, you hope that will change people's behavior. That that isn't always the case. So, so I think on the side of the, the, the expert or those with knowledge, there's, there's a lot of work to do. And I, uh, psychologists are working on you know, how do you tra act effectively transmit it so that it cuts through the noise. Um, and then I've been yeah, focusing more on, on the receiver. And there I might think, depending, on, especially for really important life questions, it, it's going to be there's going to be some responsibility on you to, you know, when you're deciding, uh, making an important decision about your spiritual life or the house that you're going to buy or whatever. Um, it's not just on others. You're going to have you, you, you have responsibility to put yourself in the kind of environment where you can you can appropriately consider and not have all this noise going on. So, so some of the work I would say could go go on the side of those transmitting the knowledge, but you're also going to have to do some work to try to um, either have really trusted sources that you can quickly turn to even, even when you just can't think about through it 
yourself, or when it's really important for you for, for you to, to examine yourself to, to put aside the time and be in the right conditions for that. Okay, we are out of time.